special episode, Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 1, Leaks. Hey there, Slackers. Welcome to another very special episode of A Cup of Ice and Fire. Just like the last time I put out a special episode, I'm going to be talking strictly about the HBO TV show Game of Thrones and not about George R. R. Martin's book series, A Song of Ice and Fire. Once again, we're going to be talking about leaked scripts for upcoming episodes of Game of Thrones. In the last special episode, we were talking about a number of leaked scenes from the season finale of the seventh season of Game of Thrones. This time, we're here to talk about the leaked scripts for season eight. Now, before we begin, I'm going to start by warning you that this episode is full of spoilers, so proceed at your own peril. Many of you will no doubt be scratching your heads at this video. What is this leak? Doesn't the final season of Game of Thrones season eight air in 2019? So how is a leak even possible at this point? Well, here's the deal. The writers have confirmed that they've completed the scripts. Of course, nothing has been filmed yet. From what we can tell, the filming doesn't start till October 2017. But they do write the scripts this far out because they need to figure out how expensive each episode will be. That is determined by things like location, how many actors and which actors will appear, and how much CGI and special effects will be needed. By that logic, it's theoretically possible that real leaked information could be coming through the grapevine. But, and it's a big but, so far only the writers and the head honchos have the access to the scripts. The number of people who could possibly have leaked these scripts is small enough to fit into a boardroom. And every one of those people have very good reasons to not leak these secrets. The best leaks come around when the season has completed filming and the script and footage are in the hands of hundreds of people for promotion, trailer creation, post-production, and editing. Even when the scripts are in the hands of the actors and scenes are being filmed on location, the overall number of leaks is actually pretty low. So the odds of the following leak, and just imagine I did air quotes on the word leak, being true are slim to nil. That, and the source actually comes from 4chan. So if you're not familiar, 4chan is basically like the dark cesspool of the internet. Oh, and as you'll see throughout the round of season 8 leak videos, there's just so many mistakes and examples of really bad storytelling that make me think this is fake as fuck. But for the hell of it, let's go through these alleged leaks and see what the deal is. By the way, the way this leak organizes information, it's basically a bunch of plot points sectioned off into scenes. I'm just going to go scene by scene. First, I'll tell you what this, the leak says, and then I'll debunk it. Now... On to the supposed leaked episode. Episode 1 starts off right where Season 7 is supposed to end, with the Night King raining down blue flames from the undead dragon Viserion and melting a hole in the wall big enough for a zombie army to go through. We were at Eastwatch by the Sea. Tormund and Gendry are supposed to be escaping because Beric has stayed behind to fend off the army of the dead. Beric dies here while killing the White Walker that killed Ed. A White Walker at some point stabs Ed to death, by the way. Tormund and Gendry ride for Winterfell as we see Castle Black burning behind them. Okay, so one of the things I pride myself on is that my audience is actually really intelligent. And if you're smart, you can already see the issue. We know the Night King was headed to Eastwatch in Season 7. We know that Tormund, Gendry, and Beric are still at Eastwatch. We know that Ed is at Castle Black, and we know that Eastwatch and Castle Black are not the same place. So how in the fuck does Beric kill the White Walker that killed Ed? How do Tormund and Gendry have Castle Black burning behind them as they ride to Winterfell if we know that they started off in Eastwatch? See, this whole leak already makes no sense, but it is fun to shit on things, so let's keep going. In scene two, we have Team Targaryen arriving in Winterfell. We finally have the reunion of Jon and Arya. Sansa then notices that Jon and Daenerys are acting really lovey-dovey, and she out and out asks Danny if she and Jon are in love. Danny deflects, but Sansa isn't happy that Jon is back. Sansa tells Jon that she had Littlefinger killed because he betrayed their house a bunch of times right under their noses, and for that reason, it's stupid to trust that Cersei Lannister will actually honor her promise to join the fight against the Night King. The Hound and Arya also have their reunion. He tells her that she should have killed him, but she regrets nothing. 
He wishes that she had killed him because of the crazy shit he saw beyond the wall. Okay, to most people, nothing about this scene is inherently stupid. But I'm going to point out that this forced story of Sansa not approving of John and Danny being together is actually really dumb. Think about it. Sansa probably does want the North for herself. After all, in Season 7, Arya does hit a nerve when she accuses Sansa of trying to take the North away from John. The quickest and cleanest way for Sansa to actually control the North and not fight with any of her supposed siblings is if John is with Daenerys and they get married. If Danny wins the Iron Throne after defeating the Night King, then John would leave Winterfell and go to King's Landing to live in the capital as Danny's king consort. And since Bran is the next oldest boy but has abdicated his place as Lord of Winterfell, that would leave Sansa as the next eligible heir to Winterfell. She would encourage Jon to solidify their allegiance with the powerful Dragon Queen by marrying her. And that's just medieval politics 101. And she would have learned that from Littlefinger and from Tyrion Lannister from when they were married to each other. Let's move on to scene three of this alleged leak. And we're following Euron Greyjoy, who has returned to King's Landing with the Golden Company, the mercenary army that Cersei had him employ, using the new money that she had loaned to her from the Iron Bank. Cersei formally orders Euron to take the Castle of Storm's End, which she remembers Robert Baratheon once told her was nearly impregnable. Since all the Baratheons are dead, there is no one holding this fortress, so they know it's going to be an easy target. Later that night, Euron and Cersei are about to have sex when he jokes about her having sex with her brother or not missing having sex with her brother. This turns her off completely. The next morning, he takes his swords and his ships and takes Storm's End. He then comes back to tell Cersei that he wants to be her king. Then we suddenly cut to Euron in the cabin of his ship, The Silence, where he's keeping Yara Greyjoy his prisoner. The uncle and niece have a conversation where Euron reveals that he does not intend to be Cersei's lapdog, and that when the time is right, the sellswords he hired will kill Cersei. Once again, on the surface for most people, this wouldn't be hella dumb. Euron would come back to King's Landing once he hired the Golden Company. That's what he was commanded to do. Storm's End is empty, and it wouldn't be a difficult castle for those guys to take. If Jaime left Cersei, or hell, in any context, it would be off-putting to Cersei to have Euron joke about her and Jaime's sexual relationship right before they're about to have sex. Even the part where Euron tells Yara that he's only using Cersei and that when he's done with her, he'll have her killed, all of that to me checks with what already happened on the show and the way that these characters' personalities have been established. Like, it clicks all the boxes. The only issue I take with this is that the leak implies that within the same scene, Euron returns to King's Landing from Essos, then goes to Storm's End, then comes back to King's Landing, and then gets on his ship to tell Yara his diabolical plan. I mean, Game of Thrones is pretty notorious for speeding through timelines and glossing over months between episodes, but this would be a huge stretch, even for them. The fourth scene from the 4chan leak of Season 8, Episode 1 takes us back to Winterfell. All of Team Targaryen are gathered in the Great Hall along with the Northern Lords and the Lords of the Vale. Even Sweet Robin, Lord of the Vale, is present. Jon and Sam finally have their big reunion, they hug it out bro styles. Daenerys then tries to convince all the Lords gathered to bend the knee and follow her. She gets cussed out by Lyanna Mormont who tells her that she acknowledges no king but Jon. Jorah kind of backs Lyanna Mormont by saying that Mormonts don't back down. But at this point, John complains they don't have time to fuck around arguing about who's going to bend the knee to who because the Night King's army is coming. At some point in this conversation, someone brings up that they haven't heard one word from the Lannisters despite Cersei promising that she would commit her troops to help them fight. Sansa says that they should never have trusted Cersei. Tyrion kind of agrees, but then says they can trust Jaime. Daenerys doesn't agree about trusting Jaime, and at this point the conversation devolves into how the group plans to defend the castles of the north against the bad guys. Jon tells Sweet Robin that they need to bring the Eyrie into the fold. A plan is made to lure the undead army into the Vale, and Sweet Robin, who doesn't seem to care about the number of people who will die in the, like fulfilling this plan, casually accepts Jon's proposal. The meeting ends and Daenerys tells Jon that Northerners are stubborn and small-minded. 
This is another example of a scene that seems like it could be legit, or in the very least, it's not obviously ridiculous. Except, first of all, why is it just now that Sam and John are reuniting? When the whole of Team Targaryen arrived at Winterfell, wouldn't have all the people in the castle been standing at attention outside in the courtyard ready to greet their returning king? Remember back to, season, to a scene in Season 1, Episode 1, where Robert Baratheon came to Winterfell. The whole castle was standing at attention in the courtyard for his arrival. And after all, Jon is a king, and it seems like the established protocol in-universe involves everyone going outside of the castle to greet the king when he arrives. So why wouldn't Sam be there when Jon and them first arrive? Second, Jorah Mormont would probably never back the opinion of anyone who opposes Daenerys' right to rule. He's clearly on a redemption arc that sees him becoming Danny's most loyal companion, so why would he in any way articulate even passive support for Lyanna's assertion that House Mormont will not bend the knee to his queen? He might know in his head that Mormonts don't back down, but I doubt that he'd say it out loud in the presence of all these other lords and thus undermine Danny's claim right after she made her big appeal. Oh, and this fails to address the elephant in the room, which is that Jorah betrayed his own house, something that they haven't forgotten in the show because it was just mentioned in Season 7, Episode 6. He might want to back Lyanna to redeem that betrayal to some degree, but there is no way that Lyanna Mormont would want his support, especially when we've seen they haven't had a conversation. Finally, that last bit about Danny telling John that the Northern Lords are small-minded and stubborn just seems like an unnecessary dig. I mean, I might be wrong about this, but I don't think I can remember a time that Danny said something this petty. Even when she was dealing with the wise masters of Slaver's Bay, her digs at them came from the frustration of her struggle to abolish slavery in a region that had a history of slavery that went back thousands of years. Sure, she dissed the wise masters and the Dothraki cows who wanted to sell her to, into slavery, but in both cases, Danny was in a precarious situation, in a struggle between slavery and freedom, life and death. There was nothing petty about any of the things that she said when she was making those digs at those other people. So it just seems kind of out of character for her to suddenly be making petty digs at the Northern Lords just because they sat in a room and disagreed with her. But everything else about the scene seems more or less plausible. The fact that Tyrion believes that Jaime is trustworthy, the fact that Sansa doesn't believe that uh, Cersei is trustworthy, all of that seems plausible. But I'm just going to take a second to say that while I think something might be a plausible story beat, that doesn't mean I think that's how it's actually going to go down in the show when it actually airs, or that it's an example of good storytelling. In scene 5, we have this conversation between Theon Greyjoy and Bran Stark in the Godswood at Winterfell. Theon apologizes to Bran for everything he's put him through, but Bran forgives him, knowing the horrors that Theon had to endure at the hands of Ramsay Bolton. He also thinks that Theon has redeemed himself because of the way he rescued Sansa. Arya and Brienne, meanwhile, are training together as Jon looks on impressed by his sister's skills. Arya says she's never forgotten his first lesson, stick him with the pointy end. He asks her why she hadn't attended the meeting in the Great Hall, but she replies that Sansa is better at those things than she is. Oh boy, there's a lot wrong with this scene from the very beginning. It's pretty dumb. First of all, we know from the confirmed leak of Season 7, Episode 7, that Theon actually leaves to find his sister Yara with the rest of the Ironborn who had survived the attack by the Silence and the rest of Euron's fleet. So how in the hell is he in the godswood talking to Bran? Now, I do believe that if Theon and Bran ever did meet up, Bran would forgive Theon, and he probably does know what Ramsay Bolton did to him. So that's not the dumb part. The dumb part is the fact that we know that Theon isn't at Winterfell, so this conversation cannot happen. The other thing is, it's kind of weird that Theon has a conversation with Bran before Jon does. This doesn't make sense because by the second or third episode of the first season, we see that Jon is actually particularly close with Bran and Arya, as shown when he comes to visit Bran to say goodbye before going to the Wall for the first time. 
So it's just a little weird to have a scene that has Theon and Bran talking before Jon has had a chance to say anything to Theon. So on the very surface, maybe people think this is a, a legit scene. This is part of a real hack. But I don't think this is real because Theon shouldn't be here. The other part about Brienne and Arya training together and Jon being impressed by her sister's skills and even the part where Arya says that she's not as good at ruling and being involved in politics as Sansa is, that all seems plausible though. Now we're going to power through to scene 6 where we have Melisandre and Kinvara talking in the Red Temple in Volantis. Melisandre tells the other priestess that she's fulfilled her role in the Great War to Come by uniting ice and fire. Kinvara then praises Melisandre's good work, but tells her that she's also made way too many mistakes and that she needs to be punished. Kinvara says that their god demands one more sacrifice of Melisandre, and it requires her to go back to the north. Melisandre then informs Kinvara that she's been banished from the north. Kinvara smiles at Melisandre and tells her, then you will benefit from your punishment. From this scene, I can so see why there are many people on the internet who believe these leaks are true. Melisandre could plausibly have traveled back to Volantis, and this exchange could theoretically take place. As Kinvara is reported to tell Melisandre that she must make one last sacrifice, that could mean that Melisandre will die after she fulfills the mission that she's going to be sent on. So that thing that she said to Varys in season 7 about how both she and he were meant to die in a foreign land could still come true. So in analyzing this scene, I don't think there's anything that's at least on the surface jumping out at me that says this is all a lie. The seventh scene of this alleged season 8 premiere shifts the narrative to Jamie Lannister in an inn on the King's Road as he journeys north to join the fight against the Night's King. Jamie is surprised by Bronn, who has also left King's Landing as he says there's nothing left for him there and he's up for some adventure in the north. Jamie's obviously pretty stoked to see him, and Bronn asks some awkward question about Cersei, and Jamie doesn't answer. Bronn then asks him what the next step is, and Jamie informs him that he's going to River Run to bring the garrisoned Lannister army in on his plan to fight the Night King's army. Bronn asks Jamie why he's giving up River Run, and Jamie tells Bronn it doesn't matter anymore. And for all he cares, Edmure Tully can have it back, seeing as Jamie gains nothing by keeping it. I think this is another example of a very plausible situation. We know that Jamie leaves King's Landing alone, and we know that the showrunners love to keep giving Braun these juicy parts to play every time he's on screen because he's such a fan favorite. So I think it's possible that Braun would join him. But the reason the leaker gave for why Bronn follows Jaime is because Bronn is ready for some northern adventures. Thing is, Bronn has always struck me as the kind of guy who didn't much care for adventures. His mind has always been on his bank from day one. I could see Bronn telling Jaime the reason he came along was because he needed to make sure that Jaime kept his end of the bargain to give Bronn his own castle. I mean, it's not impossible that Bronn is legit looking for adventure, but it just seems a little out of character. But again, overall, the scene is completely plausible. The final scene of the final season's first episode takes us back to Winterfell yet again, just as Gendry and Tormund arrive. Jon asks Sansa why Bran hasn't come to see him yet, and Sansa tells him all about how Bran is different now, so not to expect much from him. Sam steps in at this point and tells Jon that he and Bran have something very important to tell him. They go to the godswood and find Bran in the middle of using his powers. Jon sees his eyes all whited out like that, and he mentions that he's seen a warg beyond the walls. So when he sees Bran with his eyes all whited out, he assumes that Bran is warging. Sam and Bran tell Jon that Bran is much more than a warg, that he's in fact a green seer, and then they explain Bran's powers to Jon. Then they tell Jon the secret about his parentage, which John at first doesn't believe. Bran manages to convince him by telling him details of his time living with the, beyond the wall with the Ygritte and the other wildlings, and how the men of the Night's Watch stabbed him to death, all stuff he wasn't there to witness himself, and he kind of convinces John. John is still reeling from this news 
when Sam tells him that he is the rightful heir to the Iron Throne and ruler of Westeros, and that his real name is Aegon Targaryen. And this is how fake leakers get you. This is yet another believable situation. Only something about this is off. This is not how the reunion between these two people would go down. Now, why would I think that the first meeting between John and Bran would be different than the way that this scene describes it? Because the other reunions we have throughout season six and seven have been epic, but the writers also slowed down and let us just enjoy the scene. Think back to John and Sansa's reunion, for example. They talk about meat pies they liked from growing up back in Winterfell. Scenes like that make Game of Thrones so endearing. Sure, it has zombie armies and fire-breathing dragons and copious amounts of sex and violence, but that's not the strength of the show. The strength is that the characters are very human, they're vulnerable and fallible, and they have deep connections to each other that sometimes don't even need words to be expressed. And the writers do a fantastic job of every once in a while pausing from our tits, blood, and magic thrill ride to just let a scene breathe. So my biggest issue with this leak, aside from the many, many continuity errors, is that it just doesn't contain any of the heart that previous seasons of Game of Thrones have had. And for a reunion between Jon and the three people in his life that he connected with the most, which is Sam, Arya, and Bran, wouldn't the reunion be one big slow scene, kind of like the reunion between Sansa and Jon in season six? This is another reason why I think this leak is fake as hell. The writers get a lot of things wrong, but that is not something that they'd fuck up or gloss over, given how important each of these characters are and the fact that there are at least four characters involved in this. So that's it. The first leak script for the first episode of season eight of Game of Thrones. And as I've shown you, this leak is hella fake. Sure, there are some believable moments, but overall it's kind of all over the place and there are too many discrepancies to really make this legit. Plus, it's too early for proper leaks. Anyway, if you're still interested, then stay tuned to New World Slackers, as I'll be uploading a breakdown of the next supposedly leaked script for the eighth season of Game of Thrones very soon. Thank you again for tuning in. I love you for it. See you in the next video.